Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Dan Campbell. Dan's a licensed nuclear operator at Bruce Power, the world's largest nuclear, wait, we're, <laughs> that's right, the world's largest operating nuclear plant. Uh, prior to being an uh, authorized nuclear operator, Dan worked at Nanticoke, North America's largest coal-fired generating station. Um, Dan's also a chief steward uh, with the Power Workers Union, and I'm um, really pleased to, uh, to have you on the show, Dan. Looking forward to having a pretty exciting conversation about, I guess, the just transition um, and, uh, and your story. So welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. <laughs> So Dan, um, we do a little bit of a self-introduction here, but you like working at big places. Is that is that accurate? Tell us tell us more about yourself. <laughs> seems to be, yeah, seems to be. So, um, like you said, Nanico Generating Station at eight five hundred megawatt units, all lined up in one big long row there, and it was a big place, big coal pile, big smokestacks, big power station, and uh, I guess that's kind of what I'm used to, and that's very similar to the brew station that I'm at now with the difference in technology obviously My, minus the coal pile that's right all right but but there is more to you than this um you know we've been working uh closely with you uh jesse freeston of decouple studios um got um the red carpet tour of uh of bruce power to film um a little bit about <clears throat> your life up there and and um so we've, we've been chatting for a little while i know you're a musician as well so yeah i mean tell us a bit more about yourself man let's let's sure. get personal here <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was happy, so happy when you guys reached out to me to talk about this kind of stuff because, you know, it hits close to home to to be able to communicate these this transition that I went through and to be able to have it reach people that, you know, aren't often reached through our normal corporate communication departments. You guys have a very cool way of reaching out to people with all these new forums that aren't necessarily the traditional ways that big business operates in. And as far as myself personally, I guess, you know, to do a little intro, I love playing music and play all the instruments. I'm an avid boater. I love playing sports with my kids. Um, I love living in the town that I live in now that I grew up in since I was a child. And I worked with my dad on ship for five years. My grandmother worked at Bruce Power before it was Bruce Power. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's the gist of it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So uh, we're, we're gonna, I guess, you know, it's it's gonna be a personal interview because we're gonna be telling talking a bit about your life story. But you were saying, kind of going right back to that, your your family um, has worked um, at this nuclear generating station for three generations now. Yeah. Um, but there, there's, there's some interesting bits there that, that I've heard about. Um, like your dad used to work, um, at, you know, the four units, the Bruce a side of the plant, um, which was actually closed down and, and lost his job. And I think that had a, a pretty big impact on you. Um, we're talking about just transition. I guess there's such thing as a unjust detransition as well. So yeah, I don't know where you want to start, but I'm, I'm interested in hearing it all Dan. Sure. Well, I can, I can go over that piece. So I was about, uh, don't quote me on the exact number, about 12 years old or something like that when they closed down Bruce A. And my dad was faced with, you know, not having the job that he had been accustomed to and that we as a family had been accustomed to. And I say, as far as the just transition piece, he was somewhere in the middle. So he didn't get fired. He didn't lose his job, but he had to move away, like far away. So the company was big enough at the time that they were able to absorb him somewhere else. But that was in a city away from the place that we all lived. And, and that was a pretty tough time for us understanding that, you know, in other places in the world, when these places closed down, you can be just out on the street. Right. So I, I, we were somewhere in the middle there as far as just transitions go. And what did, what did your dad do at, at Bruce? Say again, just for people that don't know Bruce world's largest operating nuclear facility, there's an A, there's a B side. I think each is pumping out. 3,400 megawatts or something like that? Am I, maybe I'm overestimating. Yeah, they're a little over 800 megawatts each. Yeah. Each unit, yeah. but there's four units each side. And, and right. so, and why, why did Bruce A shut down? What, what happened there? Because those units are being refurbished now, right? Yeah, so that was a kind of an economic feasibility study that went on at the time. And there was a new management group that came into Ontario Hydro at the time to look at profitability and the province's needs and to be, I guess, 
I'm probably not the expert to ask about exactly sure. went into that decision, but I know what the decision was <laughs> <laughs> and nobody around here was very happy with it. That's for sure. Right. right. And, uh, proved to be, you know, in the long run, obviously not the right one because here we are running these reactors that were essentially going to be mothballed. And I'm just glad right. they didn't full on ruin them when they shut them down, but we got them back and we rebuilt parts of them and we were, really rebuilding some of them now and you know they're contributing to a third of the energy in ontario right now without any greenhouse gas emissions so we'll call that right. a win <laughs> right right yeah i mean it's actually interesting the second episode we did on decouple was uh uh with steve applin who's a local kind of ontario uh, energy guru and he talked a lot about how you know nuclear and coal were on the grid for a while and you know when nuclear units would come off coal would come on and there was kind of this dance that happened, but I guess mm. because we had those mothball units around, we were able to bring them online um, to finally kick coal off the grid entirely. But yeah. by that time, um, they'd shut down, I guess, Bruce A. Our coal use, I think, has went up in, in the meantime. And mm -hmm. so was your family kind of relocated down to, what was it, Port Dover or to the, to the Nanticoke area? Did your dad end up working at that coal plant as well? Or? No, he went to work at Pickering, actually, for a while. Okay. okay. And uh, he wasn't there an incredibly long time. He ended up getting another job back here before we had to permanently move anywhere. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I think that's a big part of, of when people talk about just transition um, is the, the ways in which people are tied to the communities that they grew up in and that their parents grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, and... I mean, I've been reading a few reports recently and they're a little bit flippant about that. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, you know, I mean, fossil fuel workers, it's only sort of, you know, a small amount of the total um, jobs in this country. And every day people are losing their jobs and getting new jobs. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a bit flippant. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's good to talk to someone who was kind of affected by that. Yeah. Um, so what, what leads you down to, uh, to Nanticoke to working at North America's largest coal plant? So when uh, when I was a kid in high school and I was deciding what I wanted to do in the world, um, I wanted, you know, as a kid before my dad worked in the nuclear industry, like we did not have a lot of money. Um, I knew what it was like to be financially insecure as a child and I didn't like it. <laughs> so I yeah. told myself that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to make sure I have financial security for my family, for myself, and I can lead a life with that as a base foundation so when i was in high school i sought that out specifically and i landed on you know being an operator at a nuclear power plant and that was my goal so i went away to school um for a program that would lead me to that and found that from that uh, qualification i got in college it was all these other opportunities to work creating steam all kinds of different ways that aren't nuclear fission mm -hmm. and uh I started to explore some of those and, you know, I was a 20 year old kid. I was young and had this opportunity to go live in another beach town away from the one I grew up in and meet new people and see new things. And I'm like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And I did. And it was fun. <laughs> it was great. Right. I met all kinds of people down there. I still friends with all kinds of them. Um, and I really had a great experience as a young person, just, you know, exploring a different part of the world that I hadn't grew up in that's how i right. got there <laughs> different different great lake uh that's right yeah <laughs> there you go same but different <laughs> yeah yeah um run some steam stuff and and see the world i guess it's i guess a different take on the navy but yeah. um yeah yeah so yeah i mean how how old were you uh was your first job working at nanacoke uh, I briefly worked in actually a steel mill that was a neighbor to the Nanico Jettering Station for about a year. And I was 20 years old when I started that job and 21 when I started at Nanico Jettering Station. So what's it like working at a coal plant? Like paint, paint, paint the picture for, for me as someone who's kind of bone ignorant of this. My, <laughs> I've, I've toured like one large industrial site, which was Bruce Power. Yeah. So that's my context. I, I think some of my listenership uh, will be better educated than me, some not. So. I like sort of trying to get a, uh, a bit of storytelling to to get a get a sense of sure. you know visually what what it's like. I don't know what's what, what do you can, see when you walk in there. You know, it's 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 funny. There's two ways to answer that question, and there's the perspective of when I was there and the perspective of what I have now. So, right. which which one do you want? <laughs> I mean, I mean, the former informed by the latter. How about that? Okay. <laughs> take take us through some virgin eyes and then and then give us your reflections uh you know sure. looking back on it. So 
you know, when I was away in school, that we had a very small boiler plant there that was, you know, licensed by the TSSA so we could get our experience and get our certification to run boilers, essentially. Um, and I worked there. And then I had a small summer job at a small uh, cogeneration power plant that was like 50 megawatts, ran a little jet engine. It was very small, very clean and tidy place to work. Um, then I went, I graduated college. I was maybe just turned 20 i went to work at the coal plant and <laughs> uh, the, uh, when i did my physical at the coal plant the first day i got there the doctor said to me i hope that you don't work here for your whole career it is not a healthy place to be and it's not good for you as a human being to be here for a long period of time wow and i at the time you know and in retrospect, you know, I, I appreciate that advice. But at the time, it was kind of like, you know, screw you, man. Not everybody gets to be a doctor. Like, you know, right, somebody's right. got to work <laughs> in these places. So I have to make a living. Like, I didn't I didn't appreciate it at the time at all, actually. Yeah. I found yeah, it fine. condescending and insulting. But with the... Uh, but and, and then, you know, I worked there, and I kind of saw what he's talking about. And it's a different world. It's uh, There's all kinds of industrial processes that just are it's a it's a dirty world like there's you make coke oven gas from coal and you burn that in boilers and it's just a huge operation and there's benzene and that stuff everywhere and if there's any kind of leak you know by the time you get around to putting on an air pack to deal with it and stuff like you may or may not be exposed to it and the, the coal plant or the the steel mill is you know it's an the heart of industrial um, experience. Exactly, yeah. right? Like, it's yeah. that's what it is, right? So when I went from there to the coal plant, like, it was a step up in uh, job security, pay, health and safety. It was a step up from what I was used to, so I was quite impressed with it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the just the electricity generating process is cleaner than making steel out of coal and iron ore. Right. So... Yeah, you know, twenty-one-year-old Dan Campbell at the time was pretty pumped. Like he was making more money than every single one of his friends who was still in university. He was working in a place that was safer than what he was used to. He's everything was good, right? Right. So I was quite happy with it, and and fairly ignorant to the drawbacks of what was actually going on in that place at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happily ignorant, I guess I could even say, because everything was good for me. And, you know, then the, and at the time too, the government had a policy saying they wanted to get rid of coal power. And those of us in the generating station that at the time we were like, those units weren't filling in the voids of electricity at the time. They were running full bore all the time. Right. So, right. so we, and it's a big station. So we're like, okay, like, that's nice that you want to do that, but that's not possible. So we right. kind of laughed about it, right? Like, good luck. Like, that's yeah. not going to end well when you start having brownouts in hospitals. Like, your policy isn't going to be very popular then, right? right. So it was, it, was, it was funny to us. Like, we would laugh when people would bring that policy up that the government had at the time. And then the uh, economic downturn of 2008 happened, and the electricity prices were going up. Industry was leaving the province in, in a massive scale, and the electricity demand went way down. And it was no longer funny in an instant. It was absolutely yeah. possible that they could close that place down, and they did. So, and the dynamics of working there then were like it was not a not a happy place to be. Like people were angry, they were upset, they didn't agree with the policy, they didn't agree with global warming. Period. And I was led to believe by a lot of people that I trusted that it wasn't what people were making it out to be not that it flat out wasn't happening but not on the scale that it was claimed to be and that was that was people you know justifying their own ends to a means and and i certainly took part in that at the time too you know people would say things that were potentially true but not the whole truth things i remember one of the quotes that would go around at the time was the biggest emitters of co2 are forest fires and volcanoes Mm -hmm. And while that may be true, if you significantly ramp up the third biggest contributor to CO2 in, in, in the world that we live in, like that's going to have dramatic effects. But that, th that piece wasn't 
part of the conversation, right? It was, right. these people are wrong. And it, and uh, I hate bringing up this debate now because we put it to bed, but like, that's what was going on at the time. Sure. And, uh, and we were, we were justifying our own ends to a means. Like we didn't, and it was when you, when you talk about coal in a negative light as to what it did to the air, what it did to our atmosphere, you know, that was, we took that to be, and I shouldn't talk for too many people, but for certainly myself, you know, it was attack on, on my self-worth. I spent years learning how to run that coal plant and, and being qualified to operate that equipment and learning how it all worked and that, and making a living out of it. Like, like that's like a cabinet maker making a beautiful set of cabinets, but then saying, you know, the, you, you, stole this tree from your neighbor and you're a horrible person but like i tried my best kind of thing you know like it's the attack yeah. on your livelihood doesn't feel good in your person and then just us as human beings are we have a, a reaction to protect ourselves from that and the protection was to to uh you know, not validate what was going on at the time and maybe ignore a bit of the actual factual information that was contributing to this narrative. Mm -hmm. Before before we get, you know, more to the sort of like criticisms you guys were getting and you mentioned sort of the climate stuff and the air pollution was another factor, <clears throat> but I'm still just wanting to get a bit more of a sense of, you know, again, what it's like to, to be in that plant. Sure. You know, how, how big is the coal pile? Like, what does your day look like? What was your trade? Are, are you a boiler maker or like, or are you, like, yeah. what, what did you go to school for? What's just, just fill me a bit more in on just kind of the nitty gritty. Was there a lot of dust in the environment? Like, you know, how hot was it? I just want to get a sense of all that stuff. Sure. So, um, I have a stationary engineer certificate, like a third class stationary engineer certificate. So that anything licensed by the TSSA to make steam, depending on how big it is, you need one. A TSA certificate to do that. So that's how okay. I got that job there. Um, you know, as far as our day goes, the coal pile was like, you could ski off of it. It was huge and it would change in size mm -hmm. based on how much we were burning and the ships that were coming in and whatnot. Um, the whole, the coal pile itself was its own little world. It had its own crew of people that would run the massive crane to put that coal into the powerhouse and unload it off the boats and run the huge system of conveyor belts through the station to get the coal where it needed to be. Um, we kind of took over once the coal was in these hoppers and the units and we would take it from there as operators. The, uh, the plan itself, like I said, from my perspective at the time, is it was a heck, it was a clean, safe place to work compared to what I was used to. Right now, being in an industrial environment of a nuclear plant, it was disgusting. Like <laughs> there was there was coal dust everywhere, right. and uh, and those units are so hot. Like on a hot summer's day, you couldn't spend ten minutes on the top floor of that coal plant. Like like it, it was the their hard hat would almost feel malleable. It would be so hot up there, you know, and yeah. a dry, dry heat. And there'd be like this coal dust would just accumulate everywhere all the time. And, and it was, it was gross. Like, <laughs> and yeah. Well, Did you guys wear like masks or respirators like at work in that, in that dusty environment or no? No. No. Okay. And then where's the coal coming from? You said it's coming in on ships. We're on, just for international listeners, we're on, uh, I guess, Lake Huron, um, one of the Great Lakes. This is, you know, again, like a, was a four gigawatt plant on the lake. That's a lot of coal. Like, how's it getting there? How often are the ships coming? How big are the ships? The ships are massive coal freighters and they came from uh, the coal, coal mines and coal pits in the Midwestern United States. Okay. So they they train that coal to the lakes and then you get on ships and right. over to us. And we had a big like dock that the ships would dock at and unload into our coal pile. Right. And then, you know, there's like fly ash is a thing, right? Like, I mean, what do you, what, what, what's the kind of end product or the byproduct of, of burning all that coal and where does it go? Yeah, fly ash is definitely a thing. So um, fly ash and wet ash are the, to uh kind of byproducts of what comes out of that boiler so you burn that you pulverize that coal powder into a dust and mm -hmm. that dust burns in the boiler with combustion and huge air flows and stuff and then the the uh ash like what you'd see in the bottom of a campfire campfire pit essentially falls down to the bottom 
of the boiler and some of it is carried out with that airflow through the stack. So the stuff that falls down to the bottom of the boiler, we would use water to kind of pump that out to settle and put into other big hoppers, essentially just full of coal dust. I shouldn't call it coal dust. It's ash at that point. And then the fly ash. So that's the stuff that comes out with the air. And that would go through electrostatic precipitators, which just charge yeah. it up <laughs> and then uh, and then allow it to fall and be collected as well and removed from the air that goes out. Not all of it's removed, obviously, but some of it. Mm-hmm. And then the rest just out the stack goes. And <clears throat> so it, it sounds like Nanocoke, I mean, I, comparing it to coal plants around the world, I'm guessing this was one that had better pollution controls and scrubbers and things like that. But um, you know, coal got a lot of criticism for contributing to to smog in Ontario. How how significant was that? Like at, the, at your thoughts at the time and your thoughts in retrospect, I guess. As far as pollution control at Nanocoke, um, there was there was no scrubbers on those units. There was scrubbers on two of the units at Lambton Generating Station. Oh wow! And okay. and there was uh, uh, SCR, so they're selective. Kind of like what goes on in the tailpipe of your car. There's an SCR in there too, but uh, it uh, it would remove the nitrous oxides from the gases that were coming out of the stack. Those okay. were only installed on two of the eight units at Anico Jittering Station. Wow. So, so the other six were just sending uh, the the pollution out in the environment, the same as any other coal plant anywhere. Yeah, and these units are west of the big cities, so. You know, they were presumably blowing towards uh, like Canada's largest city, Toronto, and a few others, I guess. Yeah, and you know, at the time, like the narrative again in that place was, yeah, like we we do emit pollution, but you know, all those smog days in Toronto, those are all caused by the excessive amounts of coal plants in Ohio and the Midwestern United States, and that's what's causing that. And mm-hmm. I believe that to be true. I was told that, mm-hmm. but then that was the narrative in the place at the time. So, yeah, I mean, there's this whole, I guess, co- what do they call it? Cognitive dissonance, right? When you, you hear something that you don't want to hear. And so you have these kind of reflexive responses. I think that's kind of what you're describing a lot of like, yeah. <clears throat> did it ever, was there anything anyone said that ever sort of got through that like defensive barrier that I think we all have to sort of protect ourselves and protect our sense of kind of doing the right thing in the world or? Um, yeah, that was... That was a, a sub narrative that would go on there. That, that there was environmentalists that worked there too. There was environmental engineers that were more cognizant of what was, what was going on in the world, and I would listen to them too. Um, but it was a minority of the narrative, I would say. Right, and like you said, it's more about just making sure you got food coming under your table and you can support your family and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm guessing I don't want to put words in your mouth there. Sorry about that, but I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of. Um, you know, you, you've been a, like a former fossil fuel worker for a chunk of your career. Um, yeah. And I think part of why I'm excited to talk to you is, is because that gives us a bit of a window into, you know, current fossil fuel workers um, and what they're, I guess, what they're being threatened with in terms of their livelihoods. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, maybe what they're being offered if we want to look at it really optimistically. Yeah. But maybe that's a good a good sort of transition point, <laughs> no pun intended, to, to talk about sort of what, what comes next for you. So, the government of Ontario, the sole owner of, I guess, Ontario Hydro at the time, decides we're not doing coal anymore. Yeah. Um, how does how does that play out for you at your workplace? I mean, at the time, again, we were somewhat lucky to work for a massive company, so mm-hmm. they they had um, other places where they could absorb the employees that were going to be dispositioned from this uh, coal plant. So at the time it was put into our collective agreement that nobody would lose their job as long as they were willing to accept a transfer. And that could be to literally anywhere, right? It could be um, a a hydroelectric power dam in remote Northern Ontario or somewhere. Right. right? And I wasn't interested in that. So I quit my job and got a job at Bruce power because I was familiar with this. I was familiar with people that worked here. I talked to them Um, My qualifications were valid to get myself a job there, which was great. And I had tons of background knowledge about electricity generation that was very applicable and, you know, crushed the interview based on that. So, so that was, you know, that was a great option for me. 
and right. many others. So many people that were operators there now work in the nuclear industry. Mm -hmm. I could probably name 10 or 15 of them off the top of my head. Right. And and when did those Bruce A units get get fired back up? Because you see the the diagrams of coal going down and nuclear going up, and nuclear provided I think ninety percent of the the energy needed to to phase out coal. So, mm -hmm. in terms of like from your from when you quit at Nanocoke to when you started at Bruce, were you starting to work in those mothballed units that came back? Or yeah, um, yeah. So uh, when I started working at Bruce A, units three and four were operating, and units one and two were being refurbished at the time right so um early in my career there i worked on those units and was there when they connected to the electric electrical grid for the first time okay so you, you literally saw kind of the the death of coal and the, and the rebirth of at least some of you know part of nuclear the, the nuclear that had been sitting idle do, do you like yeah why you mentioned before it was sitting idle because i guess the people were just saying there's not a huge need for it there's the, in terms of the demand uh profiles and what people were anticipating they just didn't think they needed it and i guess coal was cheaper for a while or like, yeah was that the was that the rationale i think so but i mean again i was yeah. a 12 year old kid when that decision was made <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough Dan. <laughs> so uh, yeah i mean what's uh, you you had you okay so, so you're, you're working at bruce now and why don't, why don't you catch us up a little bit about what what that's been like you had some reflections on you know looking back at nanocoke um from the perspective of now having worked in a nuclear power plant but um yeah i mean what's what's life been like for you i guess it's a homecoming because you, you grew up you grew up there and your dad had worked there before they shut that part down right yeah so i mean the first time i walked through the door i remember people telling me who had made that transition before me said you won't believe it when you walk in there it is so different it is so much cleaner you won't believe it i'm like yeah yeah okay like it's still a industrial setting which i've worked in a few of them now and okay and then and sure enough when i walked in there like you could eat off the floor in there like it's unbelievably clean that's the most striking thing and that's kind of a reflection of everything that goes on in there and just how they do business like it's big messes aren't tolerated that things have to be clean we can't have big piles of like um, some of the railings at nanocoke the hand railings would have so much dust on them that the it would like make a little mountain a peak peaked mountain on there and th to the point where there could be no more dust it would just fall <laughs> off and just go wherever right like it was, right, right. It was saturated with dust and like that's that you just don't see that at bruce and at all and sorry one more thing kind of going back to like everyone was kind of guaranteed uh, i guess some people retired and maybe took severance packages and left mm -hmm. you know their careers early but everyone was yep. guaranteed a job just because of how big ontario hydro was um you know i was talking with another friend and he's like you know nuclear did offer you know you know i guess what we kind of refer to as this gold standard of a transition towards jobs that were kind of as good or better or as you were saying in a cleaner or safer working environment um, but that's not to paper over the fact that, um, you know, people had to leave and, you know, I've heard stories of, you know, couples breaking up because someone said, I, I got to go work up here and their partner didn't have that same flexibility to move. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it, was it messy like that in terms of your, your coworkers or like what happened to that community? I, you know, a lot of people worked at that plant, I'm guessing, right? A thousand yeah. maybe more. There is, there is actually about 500 people that worked at Nanacoke and, uh, a lot of them left tons of them or, or retired um and and because it took a few years from when this was going to be a possibility to when it actually did happen it was a very slow drawn out process really so um you know people would, it would just be kind of like one by one somebody would leave somebody would go do something else that kind of thing and i'm to my for myself at the time I was probably 24. I was getting married to a girl from Southampton. And I was pretty naive to the, the repercussions for other people at the time, to be honest. So I, I can't really talk to that a whole lot. <laughs> I guess you can imagine it now, right? Because you got your own kids and stuff and you got to take your kids out of school and move somewhere else. Like oh, that'd be terrible. I mean, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, remember, I remember what happened to my dad, so... Remember that agony of him just being gone all the time, of deciding that we're going to have to uproot our family in this small little town and move to a big city. Nobody was interested in that whatsoever. And 
and yeah, and I'm sure that happened to lots of those people. I know it did. So take take us back again. So you're you're talking about kind of your your new career and your <clears throat> your new your new work environment. It's it's a lot cleaner. It's a lot safer. I mean, is it? How does it compare? I mean, what were you at Nanocoke? You were an operator, and at Bruce, you're actually like you drive the reactor, right? That's you're right. Yeah. One of the couple people in the control room at all times, running the dials and stuff. I yeah. mean, just give us a quick overlay of what 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 that's like. So, so like uh, both at Bruce and at Nanocoke, you would start as being an, a field operator. So walking around all the different pieces of equipment, turn valves, you know, watching pump start. Um, controlling all the systems that aren't controlled from the control room, that kind of thing. Um, and that's where I started at Nanocoke, and that's where I was when I left. And then I had that same role in Bruce for a few years, and then I went to uh, the certification training program and got licensed to run the nuclear reactors, which is what I do now. Right. There's a great book called How to Drive a Nuclear Reactor. For It's kind of like for dummies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get all the way through it, but it was it was pretty interesting. <laughs> got, got a little window into what you do. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, at the time, I mean, I, I mean, even now, like, have you heard this term just transition? Um, like when you were at Nanocoke, was that in the parlance? Were people talking about that? Um, or, or is it something you've heard about only recently? There's something recently. Like when I was at Nanocoke, it was all you know, anger and resentment. <laughs> that was the, that was what was going on at the time. And just people dealing with what they have to deal with to make the best of their life with the, with the circumstances at hand. I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, that I've been interested in. I was, I gave some testimony uh, to the house of Commons standing committee on, I mean, they call it, what was it a fair and equitable transition for the Canadian energy transition? I mean, it's, it's the same thing, basically just transition, but this idea of, yeah, I mean, if we're going to have an energy transition, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs or need to do different kinds of work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I guess I'm just trying to get your sense on what, what you feel about that, given the perspective you've had, you've talked about sort of the, the defensiveness and, and the <laughs> resentment, but in terms of like, if nuclear hadn't been an option, uh, for you or for your coworkers, mm -hmm. um, with the coal phase out, like what, what, what do you think your opportunities would have been? I probably would have been, um, in some Northern Ontario community working at a hydroelectric dam or at Attico Generating station or something like that. And right. I'm not a Northern Ontario person, so I would not have enjoyed that. <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, they did build a 60 megawatt um, solar farm at Nanocoke, which apparently replaced it, right? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know about the math there, but okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I've been told not to ask leading questions, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, clearly, clearly that one wasn't gonna wasn't gonna do the replacement, and um, there's not really a, a ton of jobs in it. I don't know. I've just, I guess, I've just been reading through. Uh, we're we're doing a policy report now because. Um, looking around um, at this question of just transition, you know, it's the, the conversation really seems to be uh, being led by, you know, environmental NGOs, um, academics, um, and it just as an outsider, and again, I'm, I'm a doctor, right? I'm not, I don't work in heavy industry or anything like that, but I, I do, you know, have spent a lot of time um, talking to people in the labor movement. It just, it seems like a lot of this discourse is really quite divorced um, from working people. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, really kind of superficial skin deep stuff of getting a bunch of actors in hard hats and safety vests kind of posing in front of solar panels and, and wind turbines and, you know, just transition language. Um, but, you know, and, and I've had some arguments with people, you know, some academics on this topic, um, particularly when pointing out, you know, what are the transition opportunities for fossil fuel workers? Um, and this one academic saying, well, yeah, I mean, the jobs don't pay as well in wind and solar, but and I was like, but yeah. what, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, but what, yeah. like, isn't that kind of where it ends? But I think, you know, for a lot of, a lot of these sort of professional managerial class people, it's more about sort of the glory of getting rid of fossil fuels and the glory of, of, you know, taking climate action that completely, um, you know, out, uh, what am I trying to say here? You know, out, it, it, you know, that, that, the, 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 the issues for workers, wages, you know, workplace, uh, negotiating power, et cetera, just doesn't really factor in. It's an afterthought. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if uh, you know what what you feel about that or 
well, <laughs> I can say, you know, when you try and implement a policy like that, if you're, if you're going to piss off all the workers, like you're not going to have the sway in your society that you need to make right. these changes. People aren't, aren't going to understand what you're trying to do if you're using fancy words like just transition, but not actually treating the people justly. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and then you're going to run into huge roadblocks with people opposing your policies based on what it does to them as opposed to the the value of the policy itself, right? You need to treat people fairly. You need to get them on board to do the right thing. Doing the right thing includes not just your policy, but treating people fairly. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like you need social and political license to to do this. An energy <laughs> transition is no uh, no small thing to undertake, as as you experienced. Yeah. Um, but you need people to vote for it and kind of consent to it. And I think yeah. that's that's where I really see um, some challenges ahead based upon sort of what's what's on offer, um, again, from from the establishment on mm-hmm. this topic. Um, I'm not sure where to go next with you here, Dan. Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, just maybe in closing, um, your thoughts on, um, you know, the role, the role of nuclear in terms of um, maybe other parts of the country, um, you know, speaking to workers if I can give you a chance here, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, if, if you were talking to like a worker in the oil sands or in another sort of like fossil fuel rich area in the country, um, and, and you were to talk to them about nuclear, um, you know, how, how would you, how would you frame it? Um, how would you have that conversation? I would, I think you need to, you need to disarm their fears around their livelihood Mm-hmm. So that they they can have an open heart and an open mind to really understand what it is that we're doing to the environment right now with these fossil mm-hmm. fuels. And it's, if you can do that and you can have that conversation from an open place, then you can really start to move things in the right direction. You know, if, you, if, if you're going to start a conversation with, yeah, you're going to lose your job. You're not going to be able to feed your family, but, you know, we're going to fix global warming. Like people aren't going to hear that. Mm-hmm. It needs to go the other way around. It needs to be, here's an opportunity for you where we can treat you fairly, where you're going to be able to keep your livelihood, where you're not going to have fears of being in poverty. And we can move things in a direction with our society where we're going to you know, treat our grandchildren with respect. We're going to set ourselves up for success to turn around what we've been doing and misunderstanding for so long. Mm-hmm. I think that's the narrative you have to have. And what do you think about, I mean, there's, there's lots of proposals around um, like repowering coal sites with nuclear um, as, as a way to sort of, I guess, also help deal with that question of, you know, geographic dislocation of people, as you were mm-hmm. mentioning, happened to folks um, at Nanakoke. Yeah. Is that, is that like the gold of the gold standard? <laughs> for, for sure it is. You know, the, the infrastructure is there. The, the, the people are used to having industrial settings in their communities they're used to working there they have the expertise to understand over half of the process that goes into pushing the electrons through the power lines Mm -hmm. everything is there it's on a large body of water that has cooling capability like all the cooling that goes into a nuclear reactor is by and large for the most part is condensing the steam back into water in the in the cycle of the turbine and generator and that's mm-hmm. exactly it works exactly the same way in a coal plant. Like it's that's where all the heat is coming from. That's where it's going to. It's all exactly the same. So that's it's already there. It's already set up. You know that everything's it's just asking to be built, but it's it's policy that's stopping it. It's not yeah. it's not it's not infrastructure. It's not anything like that. It's it's policy and it's public opinion and it's politics. Yeah. I guess one other thing I wanted to touch on with you was, um, you know, union culture. Um, I was up uh, at Bruce Power on a tour organized by several of the unions that represent nuclear workers. Um, and it was really, um, I think the goal was to really try and bring in non-nuclear labor um, to see the power plant, to see the union culture, because there has been a fair amount of hostility um, open or, or not towards uh, towards nuclear workers, I think, kind of mm-hmm. the black sheep of the labor movement kind of left out. Um, I, I'm not sure all the reasons why that might be, but it was a really powerful uh, experience for me um, seeing um, a lot of, you know, non-nuclear labor leadership coming and just going like, oh, 
this place is special, right? Yeah. Like maybe that's what Hamilton was like. Um, again, Hamilton being, uh, you know, their big kind of steel town, you know, in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, and it's in its prime um, where you had these, you know, unionized, well-paying, blue collar jobs, kind of intergenerational employment. Um, but that's kind of something I really saw when I was up at the Bruce was just, you know, you see, you hear a lot of people calling each other brother and sister and you go, oh, this must be a small town. Everyone must be related. But, <laughs> but it was, it was all labor speak, right? Yeah. You know, my sister now is going to speak or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, and I was asking myself, like, does this, does this exist anywhere else in Canada? Like, are there any other communities, um, that sort of still have this, this kind of labor and union culture? And I, I couldn't really think of any other examples now that a lot of the manufacturing sector's been upended and, you know, we're not making much deal anymore, et cetera. So what are, what are your, some of your thoughts? Um, because nuclear in Canada anyway, I think has kind of the highest union density of any, of any sector. So mm. get, let's, let's get into that a bit. Yeah. Tell me a bit of your thoughts on, on, uh, the, the culture in terms of labor. As far as union density goes, like that's, that's one piece of the puzzle. And that is basically, uh, workers who are in an organized trade union. But, but the bigger piece for me is the strength of that union in the work environment because i've only ever worked in unionized environments and i can tell you this one is it's it's the same union that i was in at uh, nanacoke i was a steward in the union in both places and in the union environment where i work now is stronger and an order of magnitude stronger than when i was at the coal plant or at the uh sorry at the steel mill so it's it's it's, there's more unionized people and the union environment is stronger and and you only have to look as far as our compensation and our benefits and our retirement packages to see that like it's mm-hmm. that's where the the proof is in the pudding right it was it was funny we had this just transition march um in toronto that you came down to um i think before you were there we were we were marching alongside um some other folks of the bullhorn who were saying like 20 dollars an hour you yeah. know fighting for a 20 dollars minimum wage which is you know that's better than current minimum wage and one of the nuclear workers looked at me and he's like i think we should all be fighting for 65 an hour. <laughs> it, was yeah. just, it was funny um but um yeah i mean so so why why is there that difference you know in terms of you know, Bruce versus that, that steel mill. Why, why is the, the union culture stronger there? That's a good question. Um, I think it probably has to do with, you know, the, the profitability and the reliability and the, of what is needed. Like the s- steel itself is subject. It's so much more volatile on the global market that mm. you're, you're subject to the whims of the economy at the time for how much money they get paid for it. And that trickles all the way down to the paycheck of the employee sitting at the powerhouse in the steel mill. Right. Whereas the electricity sector is a much more predictable um, kind of base thing, base requirement of life as we know it. And, and, and you're allowed to plan accordingly. And the technology that we have allows us you know, to create electricity out of uranium that we, and, uh, and just the dynamics of it allow us to compensate our workers fairly for the work that they do and not be as subject to the whims of the economy of the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was talking to uh, a guy named Matt Huber and, and he was just saying that, you know, a huge part of what sort of permits, um, you know, union and labor organization is working at large centralized facilities, those tend to be more amenable to unionization Mm -hmm. because you bring all the people together, they're working closely together, et cetera. And that that was, you know, a big difference between, you know, these contrasting visions of, you know, so-called hard energy or centralized energy production versus, um, you know, what's kind of all the vogue right now in terms of decentralized distributed energy. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to organize, you know, solar panel installers, for instance, who are just kind of moving around from one town to another, setting up stuff on rooftops or on utility scale. Um, I, I got to guess that that's, that's part of it, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was just, uh, pretty amazing for me as well. Just, uh, the kind of vibrancy of, of that labor culture. And I think it really impacted the, uh, Canadian labor Congress and Ontario Federation of labor folks that came there. They were, yeah. that was probably one of the biggest selling points for them beyond just, you know, seeing this massive piece of engineering that you yeah. kind of question whether human beings can still build it anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Dan. Well, listen, it's been a fun conversation. Um, we will be dropping a, a very entertaining um, p- 
piece on Decouple Studios um, that Jesse's working on editing right now. Um, and that has some pretty great footage. I got to uh, preview a little bit of it, but um, really got to see a lot of uh, your workplace and I think have some great conversations with you. So um, if people are hungry for more after this drops, um, you won't have to wait too long. Um, right hint, hint. Jesse, Jesse will have that out very soon. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was glad right. they were able to come up and do that and come and stay with me and walk around yeah. the plant and hang out in the patrol. And that was a great day. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Dan. And uh, we'll uh, maybe we'll get a sample of one of your tracks and try and fit that into the intro music. Or you got outro. it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Sounds good, brother. See you later.